afternoon. Well, at least it's afternoon for me, and I'm going to get going. So, a couple provisos. Do you see this up here? Uh, this overlay. Uh, I use my computer also for online gaming, and I'm trying to track down a problem. And so I'm keeping an eye on my GPU temperature, and uh, that's been up for a couple of days now. So uh, we'll have to deal with it, I guess. Uh, and also, the apartment upstairs is being renovated, so you'll hear hammering and such. So we'll try, uh, try to get through. Also, it's uh, a warm day. The sun is out, and I have the air conditioner on. So hopefully I'll speak closer to the mic, and you'll be able to hear me fine. We're talking about the past and future of research psychology. And, oh, there we go. Uh, someone on tri Twitter, a social psychologist on Twitter, posted this. Uh, he said, BEM's feeling the future started informally circulating in the late uh, you know, 2010. And 2011 was the year of its publication, the, the announcement of the staple story and the publication of the article on false positive psychology. What are you doing for the 10th anniversary of whatever you call, I love that, whatever you call, what started then? And uh, Brian Nosick, uh, famous social psychologist, uh, tweeted this in response, how it started, how it's going, but of course how it's going also uh, involved two daughters and a uh, pandemic. So that's uh, a little bit uh, more of what uh, Brian has been going through, but uh, let's talk about that. So, uh, in the original tweet, uh, Sanjay mentioned uh, Feeling the Future, the BEM article. Uh, it was published in JPSP in uh, 2011. Uh, everybody saw a preprint of it. Pre of it. Uh, I did, you know, in 2010, because it was just unbelievable. Daryl BEM, uh, unbelievably famous social psychologist. Also, an amateur magician and somebody with a good sense of humor published this uh, in nine experiments involving more than a thousand participants he tested for retroactive influence of time reversing psychological effects that is ESP now if you've had me in social psych you may have or intra or research methods you may have heard me say that uh, I know this because I've read the research there is no such thing as UFOs ghosts or ESP and I stand by that except in 2011 BEM published this and he said that in nine experiments they were statistically significant and the effect size with a D of 0.22 so what are we to make of this uh, this really in many ways and I'll get to this later in the talk uh, set social psychology and psychology and research methodology in general on its uh, side for a while and we're still recovering from it and so uh, I'll get back to this but this is one of the parts of this thing that happened whatever you call it uh, Dietrich Staple a Dutch professor a social psychologist who studied uh, ethical behavior, which I cannot get over the ir irony of this. Oh, and by the way, look at his H index. Woo! Yep, uh, he was a top publisher. Uh, in 2011, they suspend his university suspended him for fabricating results and manipulating data. Uh, and he's admitted this. Uh, and uh, you know, so now we know that yes, indeed, most of the groundbreaking research that he's published that earned him this unbelievable H index uh, was somehow erroneous or just a lie. And then this, the Simmons et al. article, False Positive Psychology, undisclosed flexibility in data collection and analysis allows presenting anything as significant. And what they said is essentially true. That is, we in psychology and other associated research areas talk about the alpha level, the probability level of 0.05. That's our probability of a type 1 error. A false positive, that is, I feel that a result is positive when I'm wrong. 
and they basically concluded oh <coughs> I need to take a drink uh, that uh, psych social psychologists have used undisclosed tricks or flexible procedures to allow them to find anything significant uh, and I'll get back in the latter part of the lecture to how many psychologists have done this. Uh, so these were the three, th oh, this thing that happened in the last, where's my pen? This thing that happened in the last 10 years, what can we call it? We can call it the replication crisis. Uh, and we can call it that, I call it that, many other social psychologists call it that. Uh, we can define the replication crisis as a belief that past studies we talk about as replicable cannot be replicated. Uh, that is, we attempt to uh, exactly replicate older studies and we failed. Uh, and all those three things, the staple situation or the ethics situation, uh, Bem's feeling the future, and uh, Simmons, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, type one error article, all feed, uh, fill in, feed in to the replication crisis. So let's first talk about replication and the history of science. Uh, so one of the more famous examples of replication was in the 1650s. Robert Boyle discovered the vacuum, and uh, you know he wanted to uh, you know uh, you know and he demonstrated that the vacuum using his air pump would work would be created in several situations. Uh, Christian Huygens, uh, you know, who was famous already as an astronomer, attempted to replicate this and finally uh, traveled to uh, Boyle's lab in England to replicate it. And the idea that a, you know, a phenomenon discovered in science should be replicable by other people in other laboratories is the basis of science. Uh, the idea of replication is very simple to understand, but it's very basic. Until around the 17th century, you know, researchers would come up with things, would present results, but nobody would expect them to do it again, or nobody would expect uh, other people to be able to uh, produce these results. But then, around uh, the beginning of the 17th century, people started to place a lot of emphasis on replication. So people were uh, writing letters to journals describing experiments, and then other researchers would read this and try to replicate the experiments. And this added a stopgap to uh, research. Uh, and in fact, an uh, interesting bit of trivia, since most uh, people who could afford to do science were very, very wealthy or aristocrats. Uh, you know, oftentimes scientists were counts or dukes or whoever, uh, and they were once they pr uh, presented a finding in the letters to a journal, they would be uh, invited to the court to reproduce their experiment to the king and queen, and so they'd set up their apparatus in the court and show the king and queen their experiment. And that's how important replication came or how famous it became. Uh, jump forward to the 20th century. Karl Popper, uh, the famous philosopher of science, uh, said that non-reproducible single occurrences are of no significance to science. That is, he's saying that science should not be concerned about things that cannot be replicated. Uh, and so you'd say, hey, Carl, what about UFOs? Can you, and he'd say, can you replicate a UFO sighting? And you'd say, no. Well, that's not scientific. Only things that are replicable are scientific. Uh, Roland Fisher, a name that you should be familiar with, he invented, among other things in statistics, 0.05, that good old alpha level we use, he said, uh, we may say that a phenomenon is experimentally demonstrable when we know how to conduct an experiment which will rarely fail to give us statistically significant results. And so what he's saying is, and being a statistician, he's saying that, you know, if I have a phenomenon such as the fundamental attribution error, 
I can take that phenomenon and I can very easily replicate it in whatever situation I want. And I do that in my uh, social site class. I replicate it over and over again, uh, semester after semester, and it's significant semester after semester. Uh, I've been doing it for 20 years. And really, replication is so important because it guards against many problems in uh, research. It guards against the conscious dishonesty of the researcher. Uh, if the researcher wants just to become rich and famous and makes up a lot of stuff, uh, when people try to replicate it, they won't find it. So it's a guard against the dishonesty of the researcher. Uh, it is a guard against the unconscious biases of the researcher. Uh, we know that unconscious biases can enter into even the most objective experimental situations. And so if another researcher does the same experiment and finds something different, it could possibly be that the unconscious bias of the first researcher is what is affecting the results. Uh, it also guards against experimenter error. Uh, an experimenter may not notice critical variables in their original experiment. And so when it's replicated, somebody will replicate it slightly differently, or maybe they'll notice those critical variables and control for them. And when they do, the results are different. Or it could just basically guard against plain sloppiness of the researcher. And then finally, it can guard against statistical, statistical anomaly. That is, I mean type 1 error. That is, the type 1 statistical error a false positive. Uh, you could find a result that's significant, uh, but it could just be a type 1 error. Uh, the uh, you know, t-test says it's significant, but that's just an error, and a replication will certainly allow us to find that. So these are the reasons why we should be doing replications. Have we been doing replications? And by we, I'm talking about science in general, social sciences in particular, and social psychology very specifically. Up until about 2005, replications were not being conducted. Why not? Uh, replication, you know, if you do it uh, and it's significant, well, you are finding the same thing somebody else found before. What's the big deal? And indeed, there is no big deal with that. Uh, so that's not going to be uh, you know, publishable. It's not going to be uh, something that a journal would publish. If it's non-significant, uh, you know, and the original study was significant, uh, then, again, there should be an ST there. Uh, you know, there's a general bias against non-significant studies because Remember, we talk about we reject our null hypothesis or we retain it, and we don't. Ne we never say we prove the null hypothesis, because statistically and philosophically we can't. We're just saying that we're retaining or you know accepting the null hypothesis until we reject it at some later date, and so that's the bias against non-significant studies. This idea of we're arguing in favor of the null hypothesis. Uh, but the null hypothesis is really a straw man. Uh, it's a uh, hypothesis created for us to tear apart, and it's not really a hypothesis created for us to believe in. So because of these reasons, replications were not really that popular up until the last 15 years or so. So as I said before, uh, uh, you know, there is a bias against these non-significant studies. Uh, there was no effect found, and they could always say that this was a type 2 statistical error, uh, that you did not have enough power, you needed more subjects, or you had high error variance. And this gets into the incentive structure uh, for psychologists, or I say not just psychologists, but for all scientists. It's publish or perish, or get grants and perish, or perish, excuse me or maybe and perish. That is, you need to publish or you're going to get fired. You need to get grants or you're going to get fired. Uh, you know, you are hired basically on probation as a college professor. It's called, uh, you know, 
tenure track and after seven years you are going to be either hired permanently or fired and that's going to be based on how much you publish and how much grant money you bring in and you know as I said before there's a bias against uh, replications publishing replications so if there's a bias against publishing replications then there's no incentive in doing a replication and so replications are less likely to be published since grants are awarded based on publication history uh, you know you're not going to get grants if you don't have a publication history because you've been uh, you know creating replications that don't don't get published so you won't get grants so these replications will not be published they're not seen as adding to our knowledge and in fact the bias against them is so strong is that JPSP the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology the top research journal in psychology does not publish replications as a rule So let's go back and dig a little bit deeper into the replication crisis. Let's first go back to Daryl Bem's Feeling the Future. Uh, what's amazing and what is in a way dif difficult for non-social psychologists to understand is that the people who are touting Bem's study as evidence of ESP say that, well, in the last 11 years or 10 years, no study refuting uh, BEM study has been published in JPSP. Well, yeah, of course, because JPSP doesn't, you know, publish replications, and for a study to, uh, you know, uh, you know, repudiate BEM study, it would have to be a replication. So, of course, no studies have been published uh, in JPSP that refute BEM's uh, research. Also. There is serious evidence that BEM in, was engaging in p-hacking. Uh, I want to say that I'm not exactly certain, and I've been studying the evidence as probably every other social psychologist has for the last 10 years. I'm not that certain that, he act, that BEM actually p-hacked, and I'll explain what that is in a little bit. Uh, but there certainly is the evidence that he may have done it. Uh, to explain Bem more, as I said, Bem, a uh, brilliant social psychologist. Uh, he is also an amateur magician, uh, good sense of humor, loves to play tricks. He's retired now, and this, was, this article was published at, and most of the research done after he retired. Uh, he was at one point in the pro in the business of disproving uh, ESP and conducting research to disprove ESP. Uh, he says himself that after trying to disprove ESP for so long, he started to feel that there was something there, and that's what made him change his mind and conduct these studies. Uh, that's what he said. I don't know if this is part of a trick, uh, an objective lesson on uh, psychology to teach us that we don't do statistics well. Uh, uh, it's really hard for me to summarize my feelings about this. Uh, it's just a big question mark. I don't know what Bem really feels. I don't know what he really thinks. Uh, it, you know, things just don't fit in together knowing what he's like as a researcher. Uh, so it's really hard to tell if he really does believe in this or if he's basically presenting this as a object lesson on what's wrong with social psychology. That is, as he retired from social psychology, he took this one last chance to say, hey, I see some really bad things going on with social psychology and the way we do methodology and statistics and the way we publish things, and this is one of them. False positive psychology. Uh, so Simmons' article uh, talked about the flexibility in uh, research methods that we use and the four uh, 
areas of flexibility are harking, low power, p-hacking, and publication bias, or as they're called, the four horsemen of the reproducibility apocalypse, uh, harking, low power, p-hacking, and publication bias. Uh, harking is an acronym for hypothes hypothesizing after the results are known. That is, once you get the results in, you go back and you change your hypothesis to fit the data, which is not what you should, should be doing. Uh, low power statistics, where you have such low statistical power uh, that whatever you find is a type 1 error uh, and not a real finding. Uh, P-hacking, uh, that is the uh, researcher uh, collects data and runs analyses until they find significant results. If they don't find significant results, what they do is they keep on running data. If they find a statistical re sig significant results and then collect more data and it's non-significant, they get rid of that extra data. Or they suggestively, ugh, su selectively report uh, analyses that reveal desirable outcomes. Uh, this is what some people have accused BEM of doing. That is, uh, he ran many more experiments than the nine he reported, and he only reported the nine that were statistically significant. And then finally, publication bias, uh, where the journals only uh, publish uh, manuscripts uh, that uh, show uh, you know, a positive effect or they just do not uh, you know, publish or accept negative findings or uh, replications. So these are important, so let's go into them very uh, specifically. Part of the cushion of security uh, in doing research uh, is to uh, uh, make a hypothesis beforehand. By having some type of logical or philosophical or theoretical idea about what you expect, that prevents you from accidentally going off on a wild goose chase because of a type 1 error. Uh, if you're predicting, I'm definitely going to get X or not X, and then Y pops up, well, you could say, well, oh, you know, Y is there, so it must be true. Well, but you weren't expecting it. And while that may sound tr trite, uh, that is uh, a very important uh, safeguard that we have in preventing us from running after false positive effects. And so you have to remember, and I hope you're starting to realize it in class so far, any positive result could be a false positive, a type 1 statistical error. So when you uh, reject the null hypothesis, when you say something significant, that means you have you know, two things going on in real life. You have a correct decision or type 1 error. And as I said before, hypothesizing before the results are known adds a buffer against these false positives. Uh, in a study done by uh, John et al., they estimated that the, it's most likely that in psychology, 85% of psychologists hark at some point in their careers low statistical power, and hopefully you're starting to really understand what this is. With low statistical power, you're unlikely to find real results, that is, results that are correct decisions, and more likely to find type 1 errors. So uh, you, know, you see a significant finding, you label it as significant, and it's just more likely to be a type 1 error than it is to be a uh, correct detection. Uh, what causes low power? Uh, things that researchers have direct control of, a low number of researchers, uh, using only a no low number of subjects makes it easy and quick, uh, but you know you have low power. Things that researchers kind of have control over, uh, such as uh, measurement error, error associated with uh, treatment, and error associated with the participants. Uh, and John et al. estimates that there's between a 40 and a 100 percent prevalence rate of research in psychology uh, is 
uh, you know, there because of low statistical power and not real results. Uh, P-hacking, uh, which is collecting data until the uh, desired results are found or, or selectively reporting results and only reporting significant results. A very common thing to do is that you just throw a ton of DVs into a study and your main DV that you had predicted may not be significant but there's the cushion of those other dependent variables are in there one of them might be significant and so then you could publish this research uh, and really what should happen is that you should develop your hypothesis and then you should do a sample size analysis you should set your sample size based on the hypothesis and the uh, estimated uh, effect size and the estimated uh, error and then you should run that amount of uh, that number of subjects and then conduct your statistical test uh, unfortunately people don't do that uh, so what normally happens is you have a non-significant finding so you collect more data and remember that sample size is part of the power of a study so that will increase the power of the statistical test making it more likely to be significant but you remember significance doesn't mean a correct hit it means a correct hit or a type 1 error so you could be getting into the error of get getting into the area of actually trying to get a type 1 error uh, John estimates a 100% prevalence rate most researchers have done this uh, more about p-hacking even with low fa uh, power you will find a significant result 5% of the time that's because alpha is 0.05 that's 1 out of 20 so if there is no effect in the data at all and you conduct 20 experiments one of those will be statistically significant just because of the nature of our statistical tests so if we have in one single experiment a dozen or so DVs 20 DVs and there's really garbage in what we're looking at but our alpha level is 0.05 that means probably on average one of these DVs will be significant and uh, a lot of the uh, you know studies that you see reported on the internet or on magazine news shows come about that way uh, the classic study where somebody said that eating chocolate will help you lose weight uh, they actually uh, set out to create a p-hack study and they did uh, and what they did is they tossed in tons of DVs and they had low power and they found something that was probably not significant that was uh, significant but probably a type 1 error in that eating chalk the in the study among the few people they measured there was a significant relationship between eating chocolate and losing weight and John found that this has a 100 percent prevalence rate and then finally publication bias uh, file drawer research sitting in file drawers that's what we're going to be talking about uh, so here's a table of different types of reporting biases that is biases that exist because of the process of publishing in journals uh, and besides publication bias there are several others such as time lag multiple pu uh, publication location bias citation language and outcome uh, you may want to take a look at these other definitions as we uh, you know, uh, later on pause the uh, slideshow publication bias is when the publication or non-publication of research findings depends on the nature and the direction of results and what we're talking about is the non-publication of negative results and let me talk about that and give you an example in two ways uh, journals are biased to accept manuscripts which find significant results and they reject a studies that is they don't publish a studies without significant results why the whole thing about you know arguing against the null hypothesis you know negative results don't you know they don't really exist philosophically any place real and also 
positive results are more flashy and exciting. Uh, negative results aren't. So what we have here is we have, this is called a funnel plot. And we plot here on the x-axis the result of the study in some type of effect size, in this case the, lo uh, the log odd ratio, which is a measure of effect size. But we could do it with a d or a eta squared. And here we see the overall effect in the field that we're measuring. And it has a uh, effect size, an odds ratio of point, uh, you know, 0 0.3. Uh, and uh, then we, all what we do here on the y-axis is uh, plot the standard error of the experiment, uh, which generally is based on the size of the sample, but also uh, the size of the error. And uh, when we do that, we get the 95% confidence interval running along this dotted line. And what we see here in this first funnel plot is the evidence of, in this phenomena, articles that are both significant and non-significant being published. Over here in this funnel plot, we see a big gap here. And what that means that is in this uh, you know, phenomenon, in the topic that we're looking at, what's happening is that only uh, positive studies, that is significant studies are being published, and non-significant results and negative results are not being published. Journals are not publishing uh, negative results in this phenomenon. And so when we do a funnel graph of the uh, results of many experiments in a field, there we go, and we see this big missing area. Why does uh, PowerPoint not want to give me my pen back? That is in, an indication that uh, non-significant studies are not being uh, published. If non-significant studies are not being published, where do they go? They go into the researchers' file drawers, uh, where they sit unpublished. A uh, good example of this, if you would look in the literature for research on uh, the very interesting phenomena that the amount of intention of a harm doer is related to the actual perceptions of the actual physical damage done to the victim, you'll find only one paper published on that, which is done by Darley and Huff in 1984, which they found the effect in two different studies. Uh, and uh, you will not find articles published by myself in 2004, 2005, 2006, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Each one of those years I completed a study uh, on the same effect Darley and Huff found. Each time I found non-significant results and those articles never were published. They sit in the file drawer in my lab. So uh, this is an example of the file drawer effect. When you're trying to estimate, well looking at the literature, uh, is this effect real or not? Well here's what I felt I only found one study and it says it's real. But in reality there's many studies, mine and probably other people's, that found nothing, and that when you look at what's not been published with what's been published, it's very clear that this effect doesn't exist. So that's what the file drawer effect is. And many of the effects that we think exist may actually uh, you know, be fictitious, and we just don't know how to evaluate it because all of these negative studies never saw the light of day. And then I think this is my second finally, I'm sorry, finally about the replication crisis, uh, Staple, uh, you know, Dietrich Staple. Simple idea, fake data can't be repl replicated because it's, you know, faked. Uh, John et al. estimated 20 to 30 percent of research is based on outright fabricated area. 
that is outright researchers lying about data. Not gray areas like p-hacking or low power or anything else, but outright lying. How prevalent is this? Well, we don't know. Uh, John estimates a third of research is fake. We certainly can tally up the number of recognized cases of researchers being caught uh, faking data. And indeed, they do that for th the simple reasons that I mentioned before. Uh, Dagblad said after being caught in a letter to, uh, you know, a public letter apologizing, I think it's important to emphasize that I never inform my colleagues of my inappropriate behavior. In fact, the people who usually report people for lying like this are the colleagues who start to, you know, figure out what's going on. I offer my colleagues, my PhD students, and the complete academy community my sincere apologies. I'm aware of the suffering sor and sorrow I caused them. I did not withstand the pressure to score, to publish, the pressure to get better with time. I wanted uh, too much, too fast. In a system where there are only a few checks and balances, where people work alone, I took the wrong turn. I want to emphasize that the mistakes I made were not born out of selfish ends. And indeed, uh, that's how most people explain malfeasances. I was not selfish, I was not bad, I was just in a situation where I had to do this or else, or fail. And let's finally take a very direct look at John's study. Uh, what he did was survey, uh, you know, 2,100 uh, researchers in psychology. Uh, this had a 36% response rate, uh, which is a really good response rate if you understand that 20% is usually the typical response rate. And he asked uh, his respondents in the survey uh, three, uh, two types of uh, dependent variables whether or not they would admit that they themselves did something in an anonymous su a survey. And then he asked them, what's the probability that the average researcher who did this would admit that they would do this? And what you notice, if you look at these two together, is that if you take the self-admission rate and divide it by the admission estimate, you would get a rate of uh, the prevalence, that is, if, you know, I say I did this, uh, you know, and then I say that none of the other researchers would admit this, then a whole lot of people must be doing this. Uh, if I uh, say that I didn't do this and I say that, uh, you know, everybody would probably be doing this, then again we have another situation where I'm probably lying. So by doing this and calculating the prevalence rate, they were able to give us a behind the scenes or avoiding people lying, even to an anonymous survey, estimate of how bad it is. And these were the items uh, that they uh, you know, asked people about. Failing to report all DVs, if you don't report all your DVs, then you are at liberty to p-hack. Uh, decided to collect more data after significance testing, that is the other type of p-hacking. Failure to report all IV conditions, another form of p-hacking. Uh, stopping data collection early due to significance testing, another form of p-hacking. Dirty rounding off of p-values, that is a p-value of 0.05 is 0.05. Uh, Point, if you uh, get a p-value of 0.51, that's above 0.05, so that's non-significant. And rounding it off to 5 is not the way we teach you how to do it in statistics, and it's not how you should do it in research. Uh, selectively reporting which studies worked, p-hacking. Excluding data ba uh, based on the impact on results, another form of p-hacking. Reporting uh, unexpected findings as predicted, harking, and claiming no demographic effects when unsure, that is, not going to the trouble of going beyond your research pools in your, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, Psych 101 classes, 
and not uh, you know emphasizing the fact that well this was only on college students and then finally the big one falsifying data and here are his results uh, the self-admission rates in gray uh, the prevalence estimate in clear and the prevalence estimate derived from the admission estimate uh, in gray that is uh, accounting for people lying how many do you th do we think really do it and as we can see here uh, falsifying data they estimated that uh, you know 30 percent or so are falsifying data uh, lying about demographics 13 percent uh, and then when we get to harking uh, 90 percent and then many of the p hacking areas are at 100 percent or 40 or 40 36 or 40 or uh, 60 percent so it appears that most researchers and most of the research you look at in psychology are p hacked and as we can see here uh, the self-admission rating in different disciplines we see that social psychology is the highest because we're the more exper experimentally uh, you know flexible uh, fields and the type of research again experimental research where you can be more and laboratory research where you have more flexibility you see the highest uh, levels of admission of uh, doing uh, things that would bias towards false positives and uh, that's it uh, I didn't talk about demographics that much I think I'll post the uh, a really neat info poster about the weird uh, you know data uh, the weird data that we get from our weird subjects and you can take a look at that at your leisure and I see that uh, my GPU temperature never popped above it 80 degrees centigrade or Celsius excuse me so that's uh, doing pretty good so I don't think uh, my GPU temperature is a problem I think it's a driver or something old driver all right so uh, I'll see you in class hope we have a good discussion about this really interesting topic bye bye